a variety of things. It's a product, really, of trying to understand a blur of experience to decipher what seems to me, at least, to be the confusion of the present moment. Uh, on the one hand, I, and I, I'm sure there are other people in this room, can't help but be convulsed by a challenge to the Enlightenment concept of reason represented by the whole debate on postmodernism at one level, and at another by the myriad of changes taking place as old patterns seem to be broken. And in fact, it sort of led me to try to ponder some of these, ponder over some of these questions. Are there any patterns at all? Uh, if we don't see any, does it mean they don't, more they can't exist? Or is the problem with our eyes? If it's with our eyes, possibly this can be remedied by a new set of conceptual spectacles. Or is the quest for coherence inherently in vain? As we more and more see differences, say of gender or of nationality, is this the end of any possibility of unity, real or conceptual? Uh, or, in fact, does it mean it never existed? That is, notions of unity were false to begin with. Uh, is any kind of generalization possible in a period of such fragmentation? And in reflection on at least what, you know, not so much my role has been, but uh, me as part of a wider group of people, are we witnessing the supersession of the role of intellectuals as synthesizers, and possibly the supersession of social policy as a unifier? Now, these are all fairly familiar questions from recent <coughs> debates. While the debate has been international, the question of the relationship between international trends and national specificities has been possibly less developed. And as I've been thinking about these issues, and in the course of lecturing and conference attendance in a whole range of countries in the last couple of years, I think a major challenge has been the attempt to compare and contrast the experiences of different countries in what feels like a period of and I say this more seriously than just in terms of rhetoric, of global perestroika. And I use the word intentionally because I've been particularly stimulated by a recent visit to Hungary. Now what's on the agenda, I think, is no less than a restructuring of the relationship between public and private. But the forms, the context, the contending proposals, while sharing such similar terms are also very different in different national traditions and national realities. And in fact, this intellectual itinerary of mine has inevitably been accompanied by a particular set of intellectual baggage, a conceptual framework heavily but not exclusively influenced by the work I've done on Gramsci. And in true kind of Gramsci guru fashion, I'll start with a quote, Take, and I, I must uh, sort of admit, uh, I'm taking the liberty of pulling it quite out of context, but then I suppose I can repent myself that. And he writes at a certain stage, to be sure the line of development is towards internationalism, but the point of departure is, within inverted commas, national. And he has this kind of infuriating habit, but every time you see inverted commas, it means don't think you understand this word in the way the common sense will let you think it's, uh, it means, but anyway. But the point of departure is, in some sense, national. And it is from this point of departure that one must begin. Now what's long struck me with Gramsci is his attempt to understand long-term international trends which stretch across frontiers, be they geopolitical or socioeconomic, while insisting that their full significance can only be appreciated through a study of historical traditions concrete institutions and practices, and different cultures which, and these are my inverted commas, translate these trends into specific national realities. For example, a phenomenon like the increase in the number of the intellectuals in the Gramscian sense as experts, or the influence of an international cultural tendency, according to Gramsci, could only be comprehended understood in its full significance, if its national language or characteristics were understood. Um, this is just an aside, but I've in fact been struck over and over, for example, how Gramsci himself has been absorbed into 
pre-existing schema, which very often have more to do with the kind of national sort of intellectual and cultural traditions uh, than often than what he's actually written. So for Gramsci, long-term trends had an international character, both because they were evident in different parts of the world and because of an increasing internationalization or international interrelatedness, a world development. Uh, he discusses something like Americanism and Fordism in this sense. Put simply, the effects of major developments in one part of the world could no longer be contained within separate spheres, nor could they be contained within, to use sort of old jargon, a particular sort of uh, social formation. In other words, these trends spanned capitalism and socialism, as well as sort of legal uh, frontiers. Yet, and this is a crucial emphasis, the manifestations of these effects took different forms in different countries. The specificities and differential impact and expressions of international tendencies constituted the field for political and cultural intervention and render the, inverted commas, national, the obligatory point of departure. And yet for Gramsci, a dual perspective was always necessary, in which the focus on the national was rooted in some kind of comprehension of the possibilities and the constraints of the international. The relationship between the international and the national was never simple. And in fact, the international itself was made up of highly differentiated national realities. National specificities were determined by complex interactions between complex long-term historical and cultural influences, the activities of political and cultural forces, the configuration of social groups, and the dynamic of the economic sphere in the context of these international trends. Now, if the, special, the specific form of institutions, structures, relations, and practices are given in a certain sense, in that they come from the past and must be taken into account by anyone intervening in this reality, by parties, by intellectuals. They are not the inevitable product of historical development or the reflection of relations inherent in socioeconomic structures. And here we're confronted by the question of the relationship, in fact, between past, present, and future, and of a concept of history which is not simply an historicism. And in fact, Gramsci uses the term historical, I think, in an interesting way. We'd actually, uh, this came across, sort of struck me, I think very often when he uses historical, we would possibly use the word cultural. But I think historical gives a sense of something over time, which the use of cultural doesn't. That is, he uses historical to indicate artifacts made by human beings in certain social and political conditions. That is to describe institutions and practices which are not natural, not a fact of nature. As such, the forms were not and are not fixed or inevitable, but can be changed on the basis of an intervention conforming to the possibilities and needs produced by socioeconomic change, by long-term trends and developments inscribed in a whole phase of history. And I think this approach helps us to ask some of the right questions about our situation, about what is new in cultural, social, political, and economic developments. For example, what can we attribute to a specific historical, political, or national context? I must admit, some of these thoughts are reinforced by some of the discussion of the 10th anniversary of Margaret Thatcher. I think there's a very concrete sort of aspects of this. What is to be attributed to something as specific as one type of government, and what are sort of reflections much more of deeper sort of trends. That is, developments which may seem simply natural, if we look elsewhere in other countries, appear in quite different forms. And that makes us stop and think that this isn't a natural form. It's not an inevitable form. There's a realm of autonomy. There's a realm of difference, which isn't to say that the form in one country is arbitrary and can be overturned overnight, but it does give us some kind of perspective on it. So what we find is a warning about generalization or theorizing from the specific or the historically limited. But there are other questions. What, on the other hand, reflects deeper and wider trends, 
whose manifestations may vary from country to country, say government to government, and socioeconomic system to socioeconomic system, but which are telling us something about a whole wave of development. And I think some of the questions that are being posed and have been posed, uh, they're being posed now in a particular form, and, and Gramsci comments on them in terms of an earlier period, is, for example, the relationship of the state to society. I mean, what we're seeing is a sort of a new way in which the earlier one of an extension of, say, state planning, of intervention, of some kinds of uh, sort of power from on high, is now being reconstructed. And it's just too kind of dramatic in the, the way in which it's happening in a whole variety of, of uh, fields to uh, make us think that it is simply a reflection of some short-term, say, political intervention. Now, this leads us to the question about what is possible within this context and about the field of intervention in which a variety of policies can have different goals, express different aspirations, and have different effects. That is, how are we to evaluate different manifestations of these historical waves? What I'm trying to suggest that is, is that we, um, that it's not simply some kind of automatic mechanism uh, in front of which we are forced to be either cynical or neutral or pessimistic or um, accept them again as natural. What we do see is a variety of expressions of similar kinds of tendencies. We also confront a classic question and I just throw this at you because it's, it's another whole and complex discussion. That is what we have, we're forced to think about at least, is what is general, what is particular, while trying in some way to see that neither can simply be an expression of the other. And in the contemporary period, when the functions of intellectuals as specialists and experts cannot be separated from the uses of expertise in the socio-political sphere. A recognition of the interrelationship between national specificities and international trends <coughs> possibly can help us to prevent a superficial cosmopolitanism, in Gramsci's terms, and provide the basis for a more adequate internationalism. So these are my thoughts, and if you have any comments or questions. Right, thank you. <coughs> By contrast with earlier talks, um, this presentation is to be more or less object-based. Um, in a sense, it's a response to Mika's question of, in the last uh, discussion session. Uh, how might one expect to find links between nationalism and architectural production? And to test this, I've selected an extreme form, a generally accepted extreme form of nationalism, that of the 1930s in Europe. For the sake of symmetry, I propose to look at the decade from 1927 to 1937, from the League of Nations competition to the Paris exhibition of 1937. And my starting point will be two comparisons. I'm sorry to impose slides on you in such a beautiful day, but uh, there you are. Ah, oh. do I have to focus this? Right. Okay, the first comparison draws attention to an often overlooked truism, that the two most eligible entries for the palace intended to represent international accord, that's the League of Nations, um, that belong to the two most international styles of the day. The international style, uh, represented by Le Corbusier in this case, by modernism, and what I called in an article of 1978 in Verkashite's modernist classicism. Uh, I put that in brackets rather because I'm not very proud of the term, especially since it's been tramped all over by others of later work. Uh, this isn't the place to develop this argument uh, in any detail or to illustrate the phenomenon internationally of modernist classicism or the opposition between a modernist classicism and an international style. But it is worth noting that uh, a jury operating in the League of Nations competition 
essentially in a negative sense, an exclusive sense, the problem was how to weed out the 377 designs to get one design without favouring any one national party or national style. Uh, and much like the League of Nations, which it was intended to serve, had a similar aim, uh, that of uh, prohibiting individual uh, exercise of national gain, national authority, national interest, uh, while allowing something else to happen. And the whole League of Nations, of course, uh, just simply either stifled or uh, activity or averted its eyes from the real activity that was going on in Libya uh, or Abyssinia. Any design betraying national or regional cultural characteristics was likely to be vetoed. Now, if you go through the various publications on the League of Nations competition, you can see that systematically uh, any design with uh, Scandinavian, German, Roman, Romanita, or other characteristic was weeded out, although it, they were placed, many of, many of the best designs came into the second and third uh, groups of prize winning categories. I, they, were, they were considered good by the architects, but they were not considered uh, potential winners. The moment that the first stage of the competition was over, and it was passed over from the jury of architects to the jury of politicians, to the committee of politicians, all the other designs, although not the architects, in the uh, ex aequo competition winners disappeared and you rarely have the Neno Flegenheimer design uh, accepted. And the only alternative was that of Le Corbusier. And the reason was that they are both internationalist, they're uncontaminated by nationalist uh, or national or regional characteristics in the eyes of the politicians. I could document that. There's quite a lot in the journalism, <coughs> particularly the Swiss journalism, which uh, records this, and quite a lot known about the attitudes of the, of the jurors, but I won't do that here. <clears throat> we might reflect in passing that style may not be the most useful handle with which to identify these productions, these, as it were, opposing productions here. That these expressions of opposite stylistic tendency actually reveal at a deeper level fundamental coincidence of purpose and meaning. And not just at the level of planning, which was the one on which Le Corbusier uh, endeavoured to sue the League of Nations uh, in 1928 for plagiarism. He, he um, passed over a writ of plagiarism uh, to the League of Nations as a whole, uh, on the grounds that the, his design in its plan had been plagiarised. <clears throat> what I mean by a similarity, uh, uh, a coincidence of purpose and meaning, could be described, again, I could do this in more detail now, but it will come out, I think, more as I, as I go on, under headings like monumentalism, anonymity, authority, modernity, uh, a, a certain kind of ruthless quality of anonymous progress, which, which both these designs uh, had in common. It's undoubtedly true that the scandal of the League of Nations competition, scandal, again in quotes, uh, because that was how it was written up in the journals, of course, was marketed by the modern movement, movement as a titanic clash of principle. We mistake principle here to mean style. A first engagement in the struggle à outrance with the academy for the allegiance of the world. A Hegelian spiritual struggle to dominate the spirit of the age. Uh, to capture the allegiance of individual architects all over the world. That was how uh, Le Corbusier wrote about it. That is what uh, Une Maison uh, and Palais is about. Uh, and that is very much um, how the defenders of modernism and the, the backlash uh, right-wing critics who uh, emerged on the other side, Camille Mauclair and von Sanger, the Trojan horse of Bolshevism, they both accepted this as some sort of total struggle for style. Now I'm going to suggest that that is uh, a marginal and quickly completely sidelined uh, aspect of, of uh, architecture of the 30s. <clears throat> what everyone agreed was that, or that despite some rhetoric from the modernists, was that the League of Nations was not an office block. Like Epito's Bureau International de Travail, which is that, uh, there the internationalist uh, um, union building, an attempt to do on the, on, on, uh, at the front of a sort of social democrat workers' front what the League of Nations was to do with uh, countries, also in Geneva. That was widely admired in some quarters as a rational, uh, practical, functional building uh, representing the honest aspirations of workers internationally. Of course, Hannes Meyer's design wasn't an office block either. But the ground on which the, sta the second stage of the competition was really fought was the ideologically unstable one of representational monumentality. 
but representative of what? And how could mo the modern movement be allowed to represent? Uh, and this, of course, became uh, a leading argument within the modern movement with uh, Tiger and the functionalists attacking Le Corbusier, not only for, of course, the League of Nations competition design, but the Mundaneum project that went with it, which is the most extreme and absurd form of international aspiration within the modern movement, and which came to an end immediately afterwards. So we might imagine the League of Nations competition as a stage set for a clash of supranational ideals, modernism or modernist classicism, competing for an idealist allegiance of Europe. My second uh, comparison is from the end of the period, 1937, and the Paris Exhibition. As the authentic grip of fascism and national socialism on the one hand and Stalinism on the other prepared Europe for world war, architecture appears to lose its power to discriminate. Osbert Lancaster's representation of the German and Russian pavilions, uh, which this is, uh, is mischievous and specifically inaccurate, but it represents a general truth. The architecture of Stalin and Hitler had a lot in common. Now, if you actually look at the, the pavilions, you could just about mount uh, an argument to show that the Russian pavilion here still maintains elements of dynamic thrust, this uh, rush towards uh, the future of the proletariat bubbling up and so forth in its, in its style, and you could contrast that roughly with uh, Speer's pavilion representing some kind of stasis, some kinds of uh, uh, million-year Reich or thousand-year Reich uh, as stability. But actually, um, that uh, analysis clearly won't go very far. <coughs> I'm going to just quote, um, if I can read it, uh, an, uh, a comment on the 1937 exhibition by Albert Laprade. Laprade was a French architect who most centrally occupies the, the ground of modernist classicism in Europe, in my view, in this period. L'exposition de 1937 est le reflet très précis de notre état d'âme, 1937. On y discerne, au milieu d'une indiscipline généralisée, une sorte d'aspiration très vive vers autre chose, encore assez vague, vers le grandiose, le hors d'échelle, l'ordre, l'héroïsme, l'idéal, la solidarité, le sens social. Conséquence de troubles économiques et politiques, euh, on voit s'entremêler avec le courant technique pur des courants nationaux très nés. So, I've been through a lot of the um, journalism to do with the 1937 exhibition, and basically that captures very much the, the idea. We're seeing the start of something which is world-shaking, uh, but the formal aspects of it are not clear yet. But it's something to do with total architecture, something to do with this aspiration to the grandiose, to what, cutting only a, a small corner, I'm going to call totalitarian architecture. <coughs> oh, sorry, I should, have, I should have said something about that. The, and all I want to say about this at the moment is that it embodies one key trick, if you like, uh, which is common to all this, all this uh, work, whether it's uh, National Socialist or, uh, or Russian or any of the other things really we're going to look at. It uses the idea of authority, modernity, rationalism, and anonymity for architecture, and it uses sculpture as an empathetic bridge between the spectator. It places the role for little me as an aspirant to the world order through statues and through relief. Uh, and it, the sculpture uh, also performs other functions, but I'll come back to that later. All right. The ingredients of modernist classicism involve wide-ranging extensions of the power of architecture, coupled with impoverishments in its forms of expression, which were absorbed into the post-war world. I don't think it's possible to understand 50s architecture at all uh, let alone postmodernism, without understanding this substantial development. I want to survey some of these and reflect on the meanings of nationalism uh, to which they might refer. And I'm going to just, my, I've got sort of three chapter headings. One is, is to do with mass scale. Uh, the second is to do with devaluation of symbols and language. 
And the third is uh, a mixture, which I could sum up with the title of folk or folkish, uh, a mixture of race, region, materials. I have to explain that when we get to it. But that's basically the ground I'm going to try to cover. Now, what we're talking about um, politically with these with developments in the 30s, in particular fascist Italy, National Socialist Germany, uh, Stalinist Russia, but also in other countries as well, uh, the bureaucratization uh, and the consensus um, government in all the Western European countries, is an extraordinary extension of the power of the state to, to, to divide and to control and to break down existing social structures. A revolution, a political revolution, which is, of course, still with us and is being extended at the moment. And what this means in, in architectural and urban terms, specifically, is an enormous extension of scale. Now, the, the relationship, this is from a, 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 a book of uh, concrete construction. It's a commercial book by the Beton something, Bau, uh, it's a German concrete construction book, uh, which has virtually as its frontispiece, Hitler, Fang it on, you know, let's get going, let's start. And this is, you know, jobs for everybody. This was the political miracle, of course, of National Socialist Germany. Uh, total uh, conscription of the workforce, the end of unemployment, the end of inflation, uh, the conscription of a secular and military workforce in great projects. It's the, the mirror image of the New Deal, uh, if you like, in, in, in America. So what we have is an enormous extension of the scale of, uh, scale of architecture and urbanism into the urban and rural environment, beyond the boulevard and into the axis, the autobahn. This, of course, is Spears' east-west axis in Berlin. That's the Via della Consolazione in Rome. Linked to the need for mass appeal through propaganda and coercion, typically in collective participatory rituals. And I suppose one should reflect that what this is different to the participatory rit ritual, the political football crowd, the sense of the meeting of the, the, the blood group, as it were, as the Germans would, would think of it in the, in the National Socialist uh, fire. The opposite to that is the illusion of the individualism of the Roosevelt Farside chat, of modern political persuasion through television and radio. <coughs> The National Socialism gives the clearest example of this. Uh, I've got a German quote, I'll try and translate it. The National Socialism, uh, born from the spirit of uh, Soldatentums, of the soldier, of the, the essence of the soldier, wanted and still wills for the ewige Wache, the, uh, the constant watch of, uh, of its, um, to be that of its people. And uh, so one of its first jobs was to find an expression for this watchfulness, for this uh, um, alert, the centre duty role, if you like, of, um, uh, of, of German culture. These mass spectacles are typically processions, typically military processions, and they typically use the fabric of the city to reinforce the message. So the uh, Via del Impero in Rome, which runs from the Colosseum to uh, Mussolini's uh, house in the Palace of Venezia uh, and links to Baroque Rome is a direct attempt to represent physically, to present a, a physical symbol of the myth of Italian fascism, uh, the myth of the Terza Roma, the myth that what happened in an antiquity could happen again now, first in Libya but then who knows. And of course, I, I couldn't find the slides, but along this and on the walls of um, uh, the, the Basilica, you have the maps of Rome from its Republican origin uh, right through to the Augustan age, then the decline, and then the idea is this map, like a cartoon, would be extended along this, this road back towards the Vittorio Emanuele Mon Monument uh, and uh, the Duce's Palace in a recreation of imperial glories. So the fabric of the city is, is reconstructed. This, of course, is the forum. By building this road, he destroyed uh, not only uh, much of medieval Rome, but many of the uh, artifacts of the, of the Forum itself. But it's creating imperial Rome as a stage backdrop, as a rhetorical gesture in support of political authority. Now, if you actually look at 
if we're going to try and look at how architecture works in relation to these sorts of <coughs> ideas, uh, it's very, a useful thing is to show what it can't do, what it doesn't do. Uh, the absurdity of uh, totalitarian political propaganda, needs, we need to be reminded of it. Uh, modern Italians dressing themselves up as Roman uh, senators uh, and reminding, li as a literal reminder of what the fascists signify. Um, the constant image is Mussolini uh, as uh, Caesar. Uh, the absolutely literal statement of the, doc of the doctrines, obey because you have to obey. Uh, all the little uh, cards uh, teaching you what you should do in different uh, circumstances. The extraordinarily direct symbolism, uh, Mussolini uh, planting of future generations, sowing the seed, uh, the, the bastone, of the future generations, uh, the, 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 one, the one bit of honor to be, to be uh, taken out of the First World War, the, the bicycle regiments growing as one little twig out of the, the <coughs> Italian manhood. Doesn't bear developing too much. And the authentic, direct voice of effective propaganda is always, in the end, infantile. Um, here is uh, Del Debio's Foro Italico, in Rome, which I'm going to be looking at later, uh, and linked in a very direct way, not only with real examples of, of the, the Mussolini youth of the, um, what's it called, the, um, I forgot what they call it, the, 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 the youth of fascist youth, and here uh, linked to that with, in a simple advertisement. Um, and the, the, the little stories of the Libyan war, little innocent Italian children uh, beating up little innocent um, black children. Now, <coughs> the efficacy of architecture, the, uh, the controlling effect of architecture or urbanism compared to that uh, has to be understood as relatively weak. And yet, it's not difficult to do an analysis of Del Debio's Foro Italico which shows a very similar ideology, ideology working and working in a very effective architectural way. After all, here you have uh, a sports stadium dedicated to activities to which people have a real relationship, actual running, actual health, competition, uh, equality in front of uh, you know, shared achievement and so forth. You have it in a form which is itself a Roman form. You have it in an, an area steeped in, in history, the Villa Madama just up, just up the hill there. And you, you subsume the Italian people, the Italian folk, into a participatory and willing uh, activity uh, as part of it. So each of these statues is a region. Uh, and so you have your mountaineering people somewhere there. Yes, he's got a rope there. He's looking upwards. He's going to climb a hill uh, and so forth. These are the, the actuality of Italian culture. Of the, of, after all, only relatively recently unified uh, Italian cultures uh, subsumed into an image of perfect unity, perfect unity within a myth of Roman control and Roman authority. <coughs> and of course, in, uh, in, in National Socialism, that is taken further and more directly, not only with the very effective use of, of flags and the incredibly effective uh, use of military force of, of the, the soldiers are the architecture, the spirit, the Geist der Soldatenfilms is, is, is spiritually there in the, uh, the National Socialist um, uh, festivals. And the people who, the Germans were very explicit about what this was for and how it worked. Uh, these, the, the fire is the symbolic uh, Augenblick, it's the, 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 the symbolic uh, perception, the view in death and life past, present, and future uh, all brought together. Um, and then it describes what the experience, what the essential experience is. This is from um, a book, uh, Schrader, uh, on German, on National Socialist uh, architecture called Architecture and Written Right. <coughs> they, the people, have the Haupt Tribune, the, the, the main tribune, uh, in, in their sight. And in the middle of that, the Führer's stand, the Führer's uh, platform, surrounded by the uh, lines of columns, of the, of the pillars. Uh, in front of them are the political soldiers, are the political soldiers, the politician soldaten. They're real soldiers, but the others, these people, are political soldiers as well. 
Um, they all have the same uh, look to them. They, they wear the same clothes. They have one aim. Uh, <coughs> they uh, see the, the strict uh, effect of the columns um, as an order, creating an effective order on them. Um, as they all focus on this one uh, experience, they feel between themselves and the architecture uh, a very powerful uh, relationship uh, and a full common einklang. You bet they do. I mean, this this is a, this is the form of, of, of architectural uh, relationship with an activity, which is a very strong one. And yet, of course, the interesting thing is that the architecture itself, when you go and look at it, is minimal. Uh, this is the Zeppelin felt. This is what we saw before. Without the soldiers, without the flags, mind you, without half of the, the back wall, which is gone, um, it's uh, a minimal architectural scaffolding for uh, an experience which is essentially one of, of controlled human activity. It uses the landscape to the maximum, the, the effective landscape, to, to disguise and reveal its uh, methods. <coughs> and of course the origins for this, sorry I'll come to that, that's, that's the, the Führer platform um, and it, it reminds one of, the, of, of the, the need for the event, as it were, to create uh, its effects. And what this is based on, sorry, is the football stadium, uh, or in this case the Olymp Olympic uh, Stadium of uh, then a March 1938, which achieves many of the same effects, but in a way which is not fundamentally different to a, to a football stadium like Wembley or anything else. In front of it is the, the uh, military plus, where you, you have uh, people uh, uh, approach in an ordered way, you have the twin pylons to guide you in, and then they're picked up on the other side by further twin pylons that take you out into the countryside uh, and out into the, the myth of um, the folk. The myth of the country, the German romanticism for the country, this is again uh, part of the Reichsportsfeld, um, a Greek theatre, uh, German trees, uh, very much part of the celebration of political festivals. And of course, the very, very important role played by uh, war memorials, this is the Hamburg Memorial, in creating these, uh, uh, the, the spirit and providing the platform for uh, organizing these political events. So what, these add up to an appeal over the heads of particular interest and factional party or racial allegiances to anonymous but universal claims for obedience, patria, race, the folk, history, and especially the war dead, supported by mass participation and feeling of solidarity. Ex the extreme development is, of course, the, the Lichtspiel rallies with searchlights uh, at night, which Speer said was originally designed just to uh, disguised the fact that many of the soldiers were rather fat and couldn't uh, goose step very well. Ironically, this idea of an activity, a life activity of people coming together in some terrific uh, white hot uh, melting meeting of the folk, a generation of an expression uh, house building of, of uh, national folkish feeling was something that was shared, of course, very widely in Germany. And I just show two examples from Expressionism. Um, these are these are socialist uh, cathedrals, outpourings, but the, the, the principle is not uh, actually that different. <coughs> now, language. The brutalization involved in this process, in the forces that I've been trying to describe, need stressing. The architectural consequences are important. The final devaluation of very many of the important symbols, to quote Gideon's phrase about Percy and Fontaine, uh, can be uh, traced to the, to the effect of applying these, these uh, principles of anonymity, of rigid control, of repetition, of scale, to an existing tradition of, in this case, Schinkelesque architecture. So you have here yeah, Trost, uh, Haus der Kunst in Munich, and Behrens's German embassy at St. Petersburg, both um, buildings which um, uh, can be thought of as separate, of course, from National Socialism, 
in, 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 well, in their architectural traditions, but these are going to become increasingly uh, reduced, stripped, emptied of uh, architectural meaning, of specificity, as they become uh, used by the state. So you have here Ernst Zagerbiel's um, Air Ministry building, and there. This is the characteristic bureaucratic building uh, of uh, National Socialism, but also, of course, for much of the rest of Europe. Uh, an, an example like the, the, the Chancellery building is perhaps confusing in this respect because it is, in, in the sense which I'm going to describe it in a minute, it is still an architectural building um, using architecture in a relatively subtle way to create effects of scale and distance and proportion and so forth. But most of what is going to happen is something much more uh, brutalizing in terms of the language of architecture than that. And one of the things that one could develop, this is in <coughs> Rome, in the, the, the Forum of Ministry Buildings in Rome, and this is the Foro Agusteo here. This is by the, by the Forum. Is the development of a feature of much post-war architecture, what I'm going to call quite uh, crudely the fascist window. Uh, <coughs> it's an element which curiously, although there, there, are, there are lots of roots in vernacular architecture in some buildings before, you don't actually find commonly used anywhere before the 30s. The, the final reduction of the articulation of a window to be a simple frame. Now, if you think of the whole tradition of architectural articulation and semantics from Vitruvius onwards, um, the relationship between apertures and people, between proportions and man, uh, has always been very strong, the, the anthropomorphic. Le Corbusier and Perret arguing about whether you can have a, a horizontal window. Perret quite typically, instinctively says, uh, la fenêtre c'est l'homme debout. And if it's, if a, for windows a standing man, it has a head, it has a feet, it, it has a functional relationship, there is protection and there is a sill and so forth. All these things are reduced. Now I would say this is parallel, this is a bit of idealism here, you'll have to forgive it, but uh, idealist, corrupt idealist art history. But, um, these are very much in the, the, the Geist der Soldatentums. The idea of the window, if the window is a man, the fascist, what I'm calling the fascist window, is a man in uniform, the man without individuality. The, 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 the man as a number, if you like. Uh, of course, it's also a very important element in this kind of architecture because it allows for standardization and uh, the, the manipulation of huge surfaces uh, which all these buildings had. And of course, the, 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 this, this sort of thing, the, the uh, anonymity of detailing, the uh, manipulation of scale, uh, can be seen even in buildings which are, in arch architectural terms, quite uh, interesting buildings. EUR is by no means the worst piece of urbanism in Europe uh, in purely architectural terms. But uh, what I've been trying to describe uh, can be seen in every detail in it. And this is the University in Rome, the Rettorata by uh, Cacentini. So, looking at the effect of the politicization, if you like, of architecture, we're talking about things which are of interest to architects, but which cannot really be seen to have the same impact as the propaganda that I was showing earlier. In some cases, of course, there are the very, very specific, literal uh, reading off that is carried out by the architecture. Here you've got um, <coughs> Mausoleum uh, of Augustus, Rounded uh, fascist windows, and here you have the assertion, the direct assertion, the reading off of what the whole thing represents. The Italian people is an immortal, is an immortal people which will always find a springtime for itself, for its hopes, and for its passions, and for its greatness. Okay. So, if you didn't understand the archaeological reconstruction of or, or the, the, the deeds of this, of the Arab arches by the side, uh, and of the buildings all around it, all these reliefs, it is written. On it, there's a straightforward uh, sign which explains it for you. Now, that is relatively, of course, uh, unusual in most architecture of the 30s. But it raises interesting problems. Is this a fascist building without the propaganda? Uh, anyone who studied Tyranny uh, at all knows that he was a, a sincere fascist, 
uh, despite uh, uh, NATO uh, apologists. And you can see in architectural terms a clear uh, relationship between the architecture of the Casa del Faccio and the, uh, the ideals of a new, uh, a new Italy based on classical order, uh, reviving in a, in a new and dramatic revolutionary way the principles of authority uh, and uh, power and grandeur of the past. But the, the problem of, of history has been, of course, to strip buildings like these um, of, their, of, of their current ideological content, contemporary ideological content. Pagano, for example, uh, criticized Terani's Castel Fascio, at least not this one, but another one that he, he did on the grounds that it was too political. <coughs> so, well, I'm not going to talk much about that, but, but these are obviously other mediated ways in which buildings which are, are modernist in obvious ways. I mean, <coughs> this is sort of like the Bauhaus, very sort of simply, uh, and has um, uh, imagery on it which makes a political message rather clearer. Uh, and that's the Mostra della Rivoluzione Fascista, 1932, which has, uses uh, forms of constructivist um, propaganda inside, which would be very similar to kinds of, of uh, propaganda that you might find in a product called uh, in, in Russia. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to protect myself a little bit from the accusation that I'm being too formalist about this. Of course, there, there, there were many cases where explicit political references were fed back into these buildings and these situations. And uh, this must be true of Tatlin's uh, tower, of the, of the processional use of an iconic object uh, which is designed to express an idea, an idea of uh, permanent revolution, uh, and then is given an actual cultural form through use. <coughs> These next just few slides will just have to stand for the whole development of architecture in the 20s and 30s for public representative buildings. I'm just going to show you uh, the Palais de Chaillot, the Musée d'Art Moderne, uh, buildings in Paris, 1937 as well, uh, characteristic of all the things I've been describing in the use of, of sculpture, of, of reliefs, of anonymity, of columns, of devaluation of scale and proportion. Uh, there's an English town hall, very Weber, uh, and that's sour and Helsinki New Parliament building. And obviously, it would just be boring to reproduce examples of that kind. This is the type of the state building, uh, an administrative bureaucratic building throughout the 30s. Uh, and I just give an example of a building which needs very little adjustment to turn it into a fully fledged Italian fascist building, and that's the RIVA headquarters. And, of course, the, the Palace of Soviets, the winning design of the Palace of Soviets, uh, and I, I really only show this because it points up a problem, a problem of ambiguity. Politicians were worried that something like this is not a, a strong enough political message. And so, in the final version, two years later, it has uh, Lenin's rather sort of uh, clearly uh, expressed at the top, in case anyone wasn't quite sure who it's for. But in the end, of course, uh, what happened in Russia uh, was different to what happened in National Socialist Germany and um, Fascist Italy. Uh, and that is that it was decided politically, not just by Stalin, but by many others before that, including Trotsky, that uh, if you like, Paris is worth a mass, that architecture, culture, all the arts is not so important that it should be allowed to impede the progress, political progress of the country. Uh, and the experiment with modernism, both in constructivism and international modernism, the Ruzi Central Soyuz building, uh, was judged uh, a mistake. Uh, the people didn't understand it. It wasn't uh, building consensus. It wasn't building uh, obedience and collaboration and political orientation. Uh, and in the end, the, the um, you know, the imagery of the Tsar, the Tsar's palace, if you like, uh, is, becomes the one that is used as often as possible to dress up uh, the works of the state. Right. Right. 
Now, I just want to draw back just for a moment. Uh, this is my last section. And, uh, try to say something about nationalism and regionalism. It's, Im it's impossible to imagine a nationalist architecture because uh, almost all the elements from which architects design things, the past, materials, levels, don't operate on a national level. It's very easy to think of uh, regional architecture or regionalist crafts because you have local traditions, building traditions, materials, uh, and so forth, which do actually uh, operate at a regional level. In the 16th century, 15th century, uh, you, you, you have, uh, in Italy, you have centers like Ferrara or Bologna or Milan or whatever, and an architect from Florence who goes to Milan uh, will build a building in a Milanese or Lombard style, or the wall of Venice. This, this, this is very uh, demonstrably uh, and obviously true. Now, one of the arguments that was going on in the 20s and 30s was very much the arts and crafts argument of protecting the vernacular, of protecting the real experience of art, which is craft. Uh, Blomfield says, I am for the man on his own hill, the man who is chez soi, who knows his materials, who knows how to build, who, who speaks the dialect, who is a real person. If you leave your hill, your valley, you cannot be real. That is, that is a, the little England mentality, but it is also a very powerful arts and crafts mentality that many people in Germany wanted to be the ruling national socialist style. Uh, I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. What national socialism actually did, of course, was to create a bigger division between uh, what's shown here, the, the creative spirit, the engineer, the architect, the politician, the controller, and the creative hands, who in many cases are slave labor, who, who build in a, a mechanized age where the role for hand has become virtually uh, reduced to, to nothing. So when Bernard Hertke, who I'm showing here, or um, uh, Schmidt Henner, uh, expressionist or arts and crafts uh, architects who were very much uh, to the right politically, dreamt of a national socialist, socialist style, which would be basically a regionalist style, one based on this fantasy, this dream of, of the local, of the, the creative genius operating within the local, they were quickly, of course, deceived. They were dumped. And the reason they were dumped is that the ethnic has to be kept within bounds. The, the political power of the nation state, especially the totalitarian state, has to distract from the local, the regional. The ethnic is best framed in exhibitions. It's out there. Now, there's a discussion this morning about what is inside and outside. What is out there is describably different ethnic primitive. That's how the French represent the Germans. Uh, that's how the Germans represent the French, uh, and so forth. Uh, and that is how Europeans represent the outside world. That's the ethnic. Once you allow the ethnic to creep into your national imagery, you lose control. So uh, the, the prototype for the, the, the politically effective message is a completely bland building that represents the state. This is Wembley in the 1904. And Great Circus is for the people. And I'm going to suggest, this is my concluding uh, argument, that the, the basic formula of nationalism is vernacular for housing, for the home, for women, women in Durndles, uh, you know, women productive uh, mothers in the home. The men are anonymous in uniform soldiers, neoclassical. So the seedler, who in many cases are people who are decanted from the towns and moved out into the country in order to grow, grow food, or in many cases undesirables, they have a fantasy of vernacular architecture, which is actually a complete industrialized building, but is vernacular. Uh, and typically many of these are people who a dump down in the middle of nowhere. There's some very interesting prototypes at the time of the First World War. Zeppelin worker factories at Schaffhausen. Uh, in this case, um, the, the steel and Eisenstahlwerks 
um, in, in, in Schaffhausen. But there's also a Zeppelin factory there uh, as well. Uh, complete organisms of housing, but built to look like the vernacular. Uh, Hitler Youth, um, the, the innocent Hitler Youth, they have, of course, a chalet. And you have to, and this would be another study, look, be very interesting to try to see where are the boundaries of the acceptable, acceptably modern within this paradigm. For example, the flat roof in housing, because of the debates of the 1920s, is not allowed. This housing in Nuremberg is, is silent power housing, it's modernist housing, and it incorporates every single one of the advances made in the 1920s in modern movement housing, but it has fixed roofs on it. Uh, if you go and see the Brits housing estate in Berlin, uh, there you have Bruno Tatt's uh, estate on one side of the road, on the other side of the road you have uh, buildings that were built just a little bit later. They're exactly the same, they have a pool and everything exactly the same as the Hufeisen in Brits, but they have pitched roofs on it. The flat roof was one element that a National Socialist ideology could not be uh, transgressed. And that was because in the debates the idea of a flat roof was seen as being kopflos. It was to do with not having a head. It was to do with something being essentially ungermanic. And because of that happened, it was unreversible. On the other hand, design, uh, there's a whole history of German design which passes smoothly through the 20s into the 30s with some of the, the best uh, designers, German designers, Wilhelm Wagenfeld, for example, works in, in, works in the Bauhaus, and then he goes, he goes on right through the National Socialist period, period and worked right into the DDR. So uh, modern design, this is very modern design by, by say, example, the English terms uh, at that date, 1937, uh, can pass through underneath the barrier that flat roofs uh, don't. Right, thank you. Thank you. One moment, there was the palace of the Soviet, and uh, I don't know for what reason, but that image uh, reminded me many of the iconography of the Tower of Babel. And in that moment, I thought about Dante's explanation of the Tower of Babel, where he uh, talks about the Tower of Babel and the split in different languages and in different uh, um, nations out of that, and he makes that the division happen by building trade. So Mason was speaking their own language, and uh, Stonecutter will speak their own language, and Plumbers will talk their own language. So there was this split of different nations, and strangely enough, it was taken a split by building the tales. And I think what I got, and I want to put it down as a thought, is, uh, paraphrasing the famous sentence, is that the nation dwells in the detail rather than God. Uh, that in the architectural detail is where it really comes up all the nationalistic position that I think is <clears throat> something to be related with the discussion of the international trend and national specificity is something that has to do with building specification uh, the control of the building specification is what it makes the fascist window and is really there where the nationalism can take place where when you move from a different technological area to another different technological area, you cannot control specification. 
therefore there is going to happen the change and generate the international element. Uh, and I think it's something that is important to make the difference between trend and, and specification. Also because thinking about, for instance, the uh, Palladian architecture, how happened that something that was very local and very national, like Palladian architecture happening in the Venetian nation, became such an international trend. And really, if we look at the building, uh, they don't have the same specification. Uh, it, when it becomes the American version, it's built in wood with a completely different specification for the building. And I think that becomes an amazing point because then there is a kind of mirror game that was brought up by the second paper that is about the question of the myth. Uh, the myth of the origin of architecture and the myth of the origin of the building element in relationship to that is like for centuries people accepted to have Doric, Ionic and Corinthian uh, elements in their building that clearly are national definition. Doric people makes the building like that, the Ionic people makes the building like that and the Corinthian makes the building like that. But then had to wait, I don't know how many centuries before coming up and to define, let's make the true uh, order, American order. So you take maize and seed of their cantus and so on. That is, again, on this operation of doing specification uh, on a symbolic level, to not only on the materialistic level. Uh, that I think is really to the two questions that was raised in the first paper. It was, what is general and what is particular? And uh, in Italian, many times we call details uh, particolare, that is, really this uh, game between what can be something generated locally by a vernacular housing, the generation of a new language, and the word vernacular comes of course from the generation of the vernacular languages, uh, and the transformation of that in an object. And I think I will stop here. I'd like you to ask a question. Yes, um, I'd like to sort of uh, address the really to comment on that. When, when did we not the interesting comparison of the building of the Palace of Nation in the 1930s? And uh, we set uh, the Galizia function style against the classical style of the Chairman's function style. Um, it's interesting that that was what they opted for in the sense that, um, I mean, um, that kind of classes was considered international style, I would think, in that period, in the sense that uh, it was a legacy of empires. It, uh, it also had a great conception of building confidence in the idea of unifying the state, you know, a legacy from the ancient world, which is maybe where they could go right back to And um, why do we actually think of modern conscious architecture as international style? I'm not convinced by this at all. It seems to be right out of Western technology. And the being played is just as fast as it was. Uh, I think the, the, in, within the modern movement, the dialectic was to contrast the internationalism of architecture as a definition. Uh, all architecture, all genuine architecture, uh, in the image of the internationalism of socialism. So, I mean, the international was seen to be the enemy of the nationalism uh, and the way of avoiding world war. So the League of Nations dedicated to avoiding war uh, within their own uh, rhetoric, it was very clear why they were making this claim that uh, modernism was, a, if you like, a way of avoid, avoiding war by bringing the world of world together. And that is a very crude thing of socialism. Um, of course, it is actually the case that, that the modern movement of architecture was seen as very culturally specific by most countries in Europe, for example, in Britain, it was seen as German. But those of the accident, because many of who came here yeah, to practice it were Germans. And the big effort was made to keep them out and stop them practicing. And the committee was set up by the RIBA to watch over all the work carried out by German Jewish architects and their partnerships with English architects to make sure they didn't take away work from British people. Uh, but uh, you know, that, that, was <coughs> that was a wrinkle from the point of view of the inner perspective of the people, the practice of the people themselves. It was seen as internationalist. Um, 
when I was watching those slides, I was thinking about some other buildings that I've seen in Rome, and, um, uh, and not just in Rome, because what fascinates me is we tend to focus on what we think is fascistic in that. But if you actually look at the other interesting architecture that was done, and at the at the kind of uh, state level, in other words, normal housing, um, there's this wonderful uh, post office, which is almost opposite uh, the FAO in Rome, which is this looks something like a, a modernist ship, or you go to Sabaudi and a new town. And so what I'm trying to say is, and, and your slide with, with those kind of, um, uh, the fascist bits taken off, uh, is also kind of a, a, an element in this. I mean, are we blurred by the particular to label this fascistic at yeah. times? And we're, we're not actually seeing something that is actually much more uh, general. I, mean, yes. I, mean, I, I went much too fast over all uh, that. I mean, I just, I mean, it just spurred me to, 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 to think of it. It's clearly question. absolutely. Can I just throw in another example? But again, this is, sort of, this is terribly biographical. I was in there thinking about the, the Coliseum in Los Angeles, mm. you know, the sort of sports stadium. I can think of other sort of any other. I mean, you know, what's the difference? What's happening there that actually isn't to do with the political regime and the ideology and so on? Yeah. And I, I, what was very interesting was that this when you were sort of saying the thing about the statuary and the people and actually the state. I mean, there's something that is actually happening in a whole range of countries in terms of state intervention, state building, and some sense that they've got to relate nonetheless to the people and they've got to have it in some kind of Populist sense. I mean, some. It isn't. I mean, they're not the size of the people, but it's kind of a representation of individuals in some way. It's not only people to people to the artists. I mean, the, the, what makes it, you know, Italian culture so interesting in the thirties, twenties and thirties, is that there is a, a dialogue, a very precarious dialogue, going on with uh, architects and painters, both futurist painters and second futurists and uh, modern movement architects which uh, tries to uh, accommodate up to a point the objectives of the state within notions of independent artistic uh, ambition. Um, and it's, it's obviously wrong to say, to refer to any architecture as fascist. If by that you mean that there is some relationship between the form of the building and its political thing. The thing about the Foro Italico has a political program, and I was trying to paraphrase it, but you can document that the Casa del Fascio has a, a political program. And you can say that the building itself is somehow different, that it's formally it escapes from the program and the passion that you've set it up, and even the intentions of the architect. You could argue that, but it's a rather precarious argument. If you have a culture of fascism, I mean, that is where Kerman fascism takes place, and that's physically where where people met the fascist cultural centre, uh, and if you have an architect who has certain views, and if it's a state that has certain views, you have to uh, go at least as far as to say there is a fascistic culture permeating this building. What you're, you're not entitled to do, I think, is what I was at times in danger of doing, and probably did several times, which is to say this looks fascistic, fascist or totalitarian or something like that. When I say totalitarian architecture, it's completely illicit actually to say that. Um, you, you have to, to uncover the actual practices and intentions and so forth, and the perceptions and the perceptions of what the boy is making his own time. I think there's a question on the back. Question. question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not quite sure whether the museums have seen all the various uh, architectural traditions of 20th century in Germany. Uh, of, uh, uh, or to say in another way, uh, everything was available, uh, so the national uh, uh, socialists could uh, actually make use of it. Uh, let's take the example we have uh, shown uh, expressions, uh, architecture, look at what we show. Uh, there are some very important uh, central differences the two, uh, when we leave the level of the form of comparison and go to the uh, most fruitful uh, architectural uh, discourse behind it. Uh, for example, uh, architectural referential frame. In the first case, fascist 
an architecture of prose or spare, classic. In the other case, Gothic of expressions. Or uh, the status of this language. In the first case, an institution is deductionalism. In the second, uh, a form of, of uh, an architectural conspiration, a uh, semi anarchistic <coughs> attitude. Uh, thirdly, <coughs> the question of representation. In the first case, representation of the state. In the second case, representation of the social idea, uh, which is a quite different level. Uh, or uh, the, the aims uh, of these arguments. In the first case, a political tool, a rather instrumentalist uh, architecture. In the second case, a means to promote uh, a spiritual revolution, as I said, the expressionists. And after all, uh, and thus the, the, the different political alliances of the world. Uh, and finally, uh, which is most interesting for us, in the first case, national, in the second case, cosmic, that national. Yes, well, I think cosmic is perhaps going a bit far. I mean, uh, you know, the, the glass chain and so forth was very folkish and it was very much to do with people, communities bubbling up from the, in the valleys and within the local. I mean, the cosmic, I think, is only in some sort of spiritual sense, or a very German spiritual sense. I absolutely agree with everything you said. I mean, it's only because I, it was such an, a completely, obscenely different example that I showed you, because I think what it does. All I was trying to say that there is a comparison is some idea of a collective meeting of peoples, of races, in some common aspiration and producing expression. And I think that is a very German theme. And I could have used many other examples uh, within Neo Gothic, for example, architecture, for example, um, Barenkamp or, or Berg in, in, um, in, in the Many other examples of of German uh, architecture which, which tries to symbolize and express coming together of peoples in an actual, actual experiences and practices within a sort of uh, gestalt, some sort of like some idea that the building relates to an idea of collective activity and aspiration. That was, that, it was just shorthand to, to show that even in the expressionism, which I totally agree with you, is utterly different in all the ways that you described, that you can find that point of and it is formally quite interesting that this Lichtspiel architecture element, if you like, of, of um, the Nuremberg Rallies is prefigured in some of those designs. So it's a, it's a trivial formal point that I'm trying to draw attention to, a, I think, quite an important strand in Germany, which is a strain not of us uh, in, in Britain, of the idea of this collective race meeting. Thirties, not just in national socialism and, and 
fascism in England, France, and uh, America, and other places as well in the 50s, uh, as well, uh, is uh, the combined effect of production. I, I very much take your point about the detailing specifications. Well, some of this is just to do with working methods, materials, industrial production, and so on. Plus political intervention. Plus a certain, I think, very important crudeness of perception. Um, a sense in which, very interestingly, a lot of these buildings look quite good in size and are very disappointing when you see them. I mean, if I had to show you as a better example, I thought I got disappointed in nice, ravishing styles of that building. But it's, it's a tawdry, miserable building when you look at it. And, and the same goes with uh, a lot of these. A lot of these things, they're, they're good in the big image. Now, that is a sort of, I'm suggesting, there's a process there, which in the, in the very different context of all these different countries, has a parallelism about it. And I take it to be something to do with nationalism. That's, that's as far as I think it's possible. I, I think mostly it's pity that uh, uh, we have such a short time. In fact, in my mind, there are too many examples. But I, I'm reminded of uh, a conference on the French uh, avant garde in, in Berlin that took place about four years ago. And there were a uh, kind of generation of uh, architecture historians, of our generation of architecture historians, German architecture who actually uh, going much further than, than <coughs> just uh, putting the records straight, but they are actually making claims of what they call the other avant-garde, which include, for example, the railway station in Stuttgart, yeah, and right. some of them takes the top with all the highways. How Unlike here, where they all seem to be a sort of tranquil uh, disposition, uh, in Berlin it took obviously a different dimension. Um, and of course, one of the, one of the counter arguments put by another older generation, uh, a German artist historian, was not unlike a uh, Dalin that you have been called, that is to say, are you aware they lack sufficient quality to justify this? Claims. But in fact, the people who put forward these uh, claims were saying, but they were our fathers. And I'm not paraphrasing, I'm quoting. Mm. And the whole issue became, became rather more difficult and uh, loaded. Now, I think that uh, I, I like to see all this in uh, some degree, but I think we have to stop it. For, for a long call, each one of them. I just want to take one example because uh, egotistically it also falls well with what I was suggesting earlier this morning. Take the Nuremberg uh, place. Well, the, oh, and combine it with the, the symbol of the fat shop and so on, and the design of the Now, this is a, in a certain way, it's a replica of the well known event in the 7th of June, 1793, when Robespierre celebrated with a fascio the festival of the Supreme Being, in which there were uh, perhaps half a million people present. No? That is to say, uh, there is this historical precedent, but with different dimension. Now, when you say that for the Germans, the French were the, were the primitive, this is not correct. This is not only not correct, it really makes things too equal and too simple. On the contrary, the French are the problems for the Germans mm. in a way in which the Germans are not a problem for the French, except the French intellectual, of course. And the French craftsmen. Now, sorry? And the French craftsmen and architect. Up, to a, point, up to a point, up to a point, up to a point, Corbusier, not being French, had done this detour and went there and back and so forth. But not so uh, among other uh, contemporaries. Perret certainly was not affected by such considerations at all. It is, the fact is that this order that is becoming so identified with totalitarian uh, regime and so on in the North, Russian or German, is in fact an order which comes from the South. And this is a very important difference. And the most important thing is that even in the South, where it hasn't been indigenous in the way which has been in Greece and Rome, it, well, in Rome it hasn't been indigenous in fact, but there was a longer period in which to, in which to assimilate and to live up to it. The way in which the, 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 uh, 
in the French context, there was a, a, they were preparing themselves for the uh, assimilation of that style, okay, ever since the Roman time, which in fact is very important, uh, very easy and easy to forget, is that the Germans were never under Roman yoke. And that is another kind of uh, dichotomy that enter into it. But subsequently, if you look more keep, uh, closer at time, if you look at the Cornet, Racine, this is the preparation for cultural assimilation of the style, which represented it and became subsequently authoritarian, in which, in which for the German, uh, nothing of them will happen. I know that Julian was trying to correct me that the, the German philosopher did speak German, but they didn't. Leibniz didn't write a word in German. He wrote in French and Latin. And, and, and so the, it was foreign. And therefore, the push has quite a different sense, different meaning, but that is, by the way. Why are you telling me that? Oh. Yeah. I, I'm, I actually am just suggesting that maybe we, we must stop now, otherwise this afternoon is going to be uh, depressed too. So thank you very much. Um, we'll, we will meet again at 2.15 sharp.